it's exactly like having childbirth, but I think it's really, really close, at least from a stress standpoint. And um, what's interesting is, though, the doctor gave me um, this medication to take, and you had to take six pills one day, five the next, four the next, three, and so on until you got down. They were completely gone, you know, for infection. And so he says, make sure you take all of these pills. And, of course, my thought was, I'm going to be so religious taking these pills because my hope was that somehow I wouldn't have to have this root canal. And and sure enough, you know, by the time I was done taking this medication, I felt so good. I thought, I don't need to get a root canal anymore. And so I kind of put it off for a couple of days. And then I realized that wasn't the best idea I ever had in my life. And it became a problem for me. Has a doctor ever given you medication and you decided that, you know, it was good enough, you know, maybe halfway through the prescription, you didn't need it anymore? You know, I had a friend that was bipolar, and he would do that on a regular basis. He would take his medication, and he'd be fantastic. And then maybe a year or so into it, he decided that maybe he didn't need to take it anymore because he was doing better, and he would stop taking his medication, and it didn't take long for you to realize that he had a problem and that he needed to get back on his meds. Same thing with a friend of mine that was a diabetic. He stopped taking his insulin because it was you know, just too much to do every single day. And he thought, you know, it's not a big deal. And pretty soon he would have a problem with that. I see that happen a lot to people, you know, where they just don't follow the prescription, you know, as it was prescribed, you know, and God kind of does that with us a lot. He gives us prescriptions that sometimes maybe we don't even fill, or when we do fill them, we don't fulfill them in terms of just taking them all the way through. Let me give you an example. Every single week, we make a declaration before we start our service, and we talk about no matter what it is that you're going through, what it is that you've just come out of, no matter what it is that you're struggling with or that you've gotten victory over, no matter what's waiting around the next corner of your life, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. And then we declare that the main thing is Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, where Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And that's really, really easy for us to do when we're having those times of conflict, when we're going through something, when we haven't gotten victory yet. It's a lot easier to stay focused. It's a lot easier to follow the prescription when you're at the height of your pain. You know, when you're, you're going through the worst time or the the peak of your struggle. It's easy to follow that prescription. But then suddenly things start, you know, kind of letting off a little bit. The pressure goes away. You don't feel maybe the need to follow that anymore, or at least not as religiously, and so you kind of slack off a little bit. Right after Easter, we started a series on revival. And I think back in April, it looked, you know, like there was such a great need not just in our church, but all of God's church, to really experience revival, to have an awakening where our hearts would be reconnected, reunited with Christ, that we would have that sense of passion and vibrancy restored to us. And people, man, you guys were on board. Everybody was on board. And yesterday I noticed as I was watching the Cubs games, and they actually beat the Cardinals again, which was absolutely amazing. But nevertheless, I was watching it, and I noticed that the stands were full of people because Illinois now is open completely. And so the stands are full of people, no masks, no social dis. I mean, it looks so normal. And you know what happens when things start to look normal? Then we kind of start slacking off just a little bit. And that's kind of what I feel like in, in God's church right now. But I know one thing for sure. In April, when God inspired this series... He knew that June 13th was coming. And he knew that there was a purpose, you know, for the message that he would would place on my heart for his church. And I hope that in, in spite of the normalcy that we're starting to feel, that you wouldn't put off or delay or, you know, uh, stop taking your meds, if you will, and that you would continue with what God's doing in your life because there's dead and dying stuff in all of us that needs to be revived. 
There's things in us that is hindering us from experiencing the fullness of our relationship with God. Long before children of Israel ever really truly rebelled against God, you know, Moses told the people, this is what the Lord wants you to know, when you've eaten and been satisfied, don't forget me. Now, in their minds, that was the craziest thing they could have ever heard. Why would we ever forget God? He's done so much for us. And yet history proves that they did. When the pressure came off, when they began to fulfill a lot of the promises, you know, or experience the fulfillment of God's promises, they kind of slacked off in the relationship side and just kind of enjoyed life. And we can do the same thing. And I'm telling you this because, you know, we have this week and two more weeks that's going to conclude this series. And I can't believe that God extended it this long just so we can fill the time and the calendar. There's some unfinished work that he wants to do in our lives and in the life of his church. So I pray that you would have, you know, eyes that can see, ears that would be attentive, and a heart that would be receptive for what God has for you today and the next couple of weeks. In spite of what you may feel inside in terms of getting better, in terms of things just getting back to normal, take your meds. Amen? Let's pray. God in heaven, I pray that we do take our meds. I pray that we do, Lord, recognize how important it is for us, uh, Lord, to, to stay on course with you, to stay focused, to stay locked into your word and all that you would have for us. Lord, there is work that you want to accomplish in us, Lord, that would revive our hearts, that would reconnect our passions to you and your work. Lord, open our eyes to see this morning open our eyes to hear, and allow our hearts to receive your word with thanksgiving. Allow your Holy Spirit right now to dwell among us, to descend upon us, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. How many of you know that right now God is at work making people into the likeness of his Son? That's what he's doing right now. I mean, how many of you know that this is why he saved us? This is why He sealed us with His Holy Spirit, and this is why He sanctified us. His work in our lives is to shape us into the likeness of His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was the only man who ever lived on this planet who from birth to death was exactly what God created man to be in the first place. In fact, when the father looked at his son, you know what he said? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How amazing would it be as a parent to never be disappointed with your children? I mean, wouldn't that be great? Well, listen, God never had cause to be disappointed with his son. Jesus was the perfect son of God and the perfect son of man. But when he came into the world, his conception was not by the seed of man, nor was it by the will of man, but by the Holy Spirit of God. And that's so important for you to hear today. Gabriel explained it to Mary like this in Luke chapter 135. He told her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And let me tell you why this is important for us to know. When you were born again, when you got saved, when we asked Christ to forgive us of our sin and to be the Lord of our lives, then we began a new life which was conceived in us by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? We were then sealed with that Spirit, filled with that Spirit. We were led by that Spirit, and as God continues His work in us, He produces in us the fruit of that Spirit, which is simply the character of Christ. And as long as we don't grieve, as long as we don't quench that Spirit, He's free to produce the fruit of Christ-likeness in our lives. And listen, if you really want to revitalize your faith, if you really want to experience true heaven-sent revival, if you really want to move beyond your stale 
and stagnant walk with God, you've got to become more like Christ. Paul describes it like this in Romans chapter 12. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And then he says, this is your spiritual act of worship. He says, don't conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he says this, you're going to be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Folks, if we really want to see the dead things in our lives revive, all those things that we need to have a healthy and a productive walk with God restored and renewed in us, then we have got to work to become more like Christ. Paul gives us three keys here to revive our faith and for us to cooperate with God in His work to make that happen, to make us more like Jesus. And the first one I want to talk about is number one, dedication. Listen to verse one. Again, he says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And he says, this is your spiritual act of worship. What I want you to notice about this is what Paul presents here as the highest obligation in our lives is not given to us as a command, but rather as a plea. In other words, he doesn't say, I order you to do this. He doesn't say, I command you to do this. He says, therefore, I urge you to do this. Now, I was taught growing up, in my faith, that the word therefore is always there for a reason. And it usually refers back to what has previously been said. And in this case, it'd be good to go all the way back and read the first 11 chapters of Romans before reading the therefore, and then what follows in chapter 12. Because Romans chapter 1 through 11 really is what the therefore is there for. In fact, the first 11 chapters of Romans tells us some amazing things about the power. It tells us about the majesty and the mercy of God. And the point of the therefore is that once we know who God is, once we know what God has done and what God has promised to do, then we have every reason in the world to want to dedicate our lives to Him. Not because it's our duty, but because it is our desire. Sometimes it's real hard to tell the difference between those two, isn't it? I mean, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between desire and duty. I've been a Christian for for 36 years, and there's been many of those years that I simply responded to God, served God, related to God, out of nothing more than an obligation to God little to no desire in my heart at all. I mean, I'm just going through the motions. I'm teaching the Bible. I'm preaching His Word. I'm serving His church. Many times throughout my Christian life, I have found myself serving God out of obligation and not desire. And it's in those moments that I realize that in my heart, there has been some things that have died in me, passion that has died in me. And I begin to pray to God to revive me. And as he revives me every single time, that obligation turns into desire. So if you're here this morning and you're serving God out of obligation, praise the Lord, you're doing something. But you ought to recognize that and say, Lord, I don't want to serve you out of obligation. I want to serve you out out of the desire of my heart. And right now I'm not able to, God. Because there's something dead in me. There's something stopping me from doing that. Sometimes it's really hard to tell. Because you can be doing so many things for the Lord. and I mean, you're just serving. You're not really saying anything. You know, there isn't a lot of signs that it's more out of obligation than desire. And sometimes you can just kind of mask that. You really can't see the difference between the two. Let me show you what I mean. You ever noticed that when most couples first fall in love, every little act of service to each other 
feels like a privilege. It really does. I mean, there's no real hardship in meeting each other's needs at all. In fact, it seems pretty effortless, especially in the, the beginnings. But then somehow over time, when our passions fade, those same acts of love turn into responsibilities. You ever notice that those affectionate favors suddenly become mandatory behaviors? And what once, you know, was this natural overflow of love now looks like, you know, just a bunch of rule keeping? Trust me, this can happen over time in almost every long-term re relationship we have. And unfortunately, that can include our relationship with God. I mean, in the beginning, there are those sweet times, man, when every act of service to Him is nothing more than an overflow of our love for Him, our passion for Him. We can't wait to get busy for Jesus. I mean, we're out there doing it all, and there's so much love and passion in us that we just naturally want to serve Him. Then there are those times when things in us start dying. You know what I'm talking about? Our love for others, our compassion, our kindness, our loyalty, our trust. Those convictions that once kept you grounded. That distinctiveness that separated you from the rest of the world. And when things like that start dying in us, every act of service to God starts to feel like an obligation. This is why so many people get stuck in the rule-keeping attitude, and they forget how effortless their love for God used to be. Their life of faith becomes draining rather than inspiring. Folks, if that sounds kind of like you this morning, let me challenge you to do whatever you got to do to stoke your passion for God, to lay your heart before Him and say, Lord, examine me. Find anything in me that is not right before you. Reveal to me those dead or dying things that are separating me from you. If all you've got for God right now, if all you've got for Him is forced obedience, I encourage you to give it to Him. Give it to Him. Listen, that's the only thing to save my life and my faith many times is just continuing to do what I know I'm supposed to do even when I don't feel like doing it. So if all you got for God is this forced obedience, give it to Him, but don't let it end there. Don't let that define your relationship with Him. It's far better to tend to your heart because following Jesus really is a heart issue long before it ever is a behavioral issue. In fact, the heart is filled with Him. And when it is filled with Him, the behavior is going to happen naturally. God approaches us with enthusiasm. He approaches us with this passionate desire. And when we can respond to Him in the same way, every act of service we render to Him really will feel like a privilege to us. I'm doing a Bible study of the book of Romans right now, and I'm doing it for a recovery group that I want to lead this fall. And I want you to notice the enthusiasm and desire Paul shows us that God has for us. And maybe you can kind of allow this, you know, to inspire you to want to re respond to him maybe in the same way. These are amazing passages of Scripture. I I've learned them as a brand new Christian years ago. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that passion or what? I mean, that's a God that loves us so much. Listen, you wouldn't give somebody the time of day, you know, that poked you in the eye. You know, that said horrible things against you. And yet the Bible says God demonstrates his love for us. While we were sinning against him. He says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 8.1 tells us therefore there is now, listen to this, 
no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And then listen to Romans 8.38 and 9. He says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it goes on, on and on and on. God is good. But more than that, God has been and is good to us all the time. I don't know about you, but he's taken hell out of my future and he's put heaven in my heart. He made the ultimate sacrifice to give me life and in Christ he gives us unspeakable joy that is full of glory and he gives us a peace that surpasses understanding. He fills us with the hope. He gives us help. He guides us with his own hand. So don't you think that our reason for dedicating our lives to God, to God might ought to rise far above just a sense of duty? Don't you think it ought to be the desire of our heart because of who He is and what He's done? Some may think, Pastor, what's it really matter? I mean, as long as we do what we're supposed to do, right? I mean, rather we serve from a sense of duty or the desire of our heart, what's it really matter? Well, trust me, there are thousands of churches who believe this and they teach others to believe it as well. But you know what the problem with this is, other than what I've already told you? Most of you already know for sure that this doesn't work in relationships, especially in your marriage. I mean, seriously, who wants their spouse to serve them out of obligation? Guys, I wouldn't answer that out loud. As I was wrapping up this message Friday, I was at home and I was getting ready to send it off. Actually, I think I'd already sent one version off to the people who put our slide presentations together. And I was just kind of feeling like something was still missing. And I was just kind of sitting there praying. And, and my wife sent me this passage of scripture for me to kind of meditate on. And I want to share it with you because I thought this was exactly what God wanted today. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, it says this, This is what the Lord says, Let the wise boast, let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts, boasts about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. God wants us to brag about knowing Him. You can't really know God out of obligation. In fact, if you try to do the things Christians are supposed to do and be what a Christian is supposed to be and serve as a Christian is supposed to serve. If you try to do these things from a sense of duty, you're always going to be looking for shortcuts. You're always going to be making excuses because you're just going to want to get the job done. You're not going to want to spend any time at the master's table. You're not going to want to spend any time at the master's feet. You just want to get the job done. When you have these dead things in your life that we've talked about, things that need to be revived, your approach is always going to be this. How little of myself, my time and my energy, can I give to the things of God and still have a clear conscience? How can I serve the Lord and make it easier on myself at the same time? In other words, what's the bare minimum? What's the bare minimum I need to do just to get by? And then you know what you're going to do? You're going to rationalize. You're going to rationalize what God expects of you and what He doesn't. 
You're going to reduce the level of your involvement. You're just going to clock in and clock out, and you're going to tell yourself that you deserve a break. That's not the kind of relationship that you're going to have much to brag about. Sound familiar to anybody? Ask yourself this, when was the last time, man, that I did anything? When's the last time I did anything for God because it was my heart's desire and it compelled me to? Your answer will reveal the true depth of your need for revival. Folks, we'll never give God the best of our lives out of a sense of duty. It can only happen when it is truly Truly the desires of our heart. The last part of verse 1 has been translated in different ways, and I really like the old King James Version. It says, the dedication of a life to God, which is defined as the living sacrifice. It says that it is your reasonable service. In other words, all those, those great things that God's done for us in Christ, and because of the great truth of who God is, The dedication of our lives to Him as the desire of our hearts is reasonable. In other words, it makes sense. It's appropriate. It's the right thing to do. It's the the, the only response to God that is rational and logical. Listen, before Christ came, our sacrifices, you know, that, that, that we offer to Him or what they were called animal sacrifices. People would offer animals to God as a sacrifice, as an atonement for their sin. I mean, think about this. These were animals that were unreasoning. They were incapable of rational you know, thought. So you understand that the sacrifice itself, that animal, had no comprehension of the meaning of sacrifice. Being sacrificed at the altar to the animal, it wasn't any different than being slaughtered at the meat market. But then came the perfect sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice, the one who looked up from the altar, fully aware of what was going on, fully aware of what was happening to him. And he spoke. And he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That was the sacrifice that was made for us. You understand, God doesn't want the blood of bulls and goats anymore. He wants us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to Him. And He wants us to do it with a clear understanding of who we are in Christ and what we're doing and why we're doing it. And I'm going to tell you something. When we can do that, we're going to experience an amazing revival. And God Himself will awaken and revitalize our faith. But God wants it to be the desire of our heart because it is the desire of His heart. It's the only way offering our lives to God as a living sacrifice is ever going to make any sense to us. It's the only way it's ever going to be acceptable to us. God wants every act of service to Him to feel like a privilege. Like we get to do this. I mean, He wants you you to be willing to stand in line all day long, just to get your turn, just to have the privilege, just have the opportunity to serve Him. We had a carnival last week. I saw people standing in line waiting to get their turn. Would it be unto God that His church would stand in line waiting to get their turn just to serve Him, just have the privilege to be in His presence? For us to cooperate with God in reviving us, And making us more and more like Jesus. The second key we need is number two, separation. Verse two says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. You understand, God's not talking about the dust of the earth. He's not talking about the atmosphere, outer space. He's talking about the spirit of the age that that, that, that opposes him. The spirit of the age that opposes him and would exclude him from our lives. Listen, God loves the world of humanity, but there's also a world system that is anti-God, and we're not supposed to love anything that hates God or causes us to hate God. This is the meaning of 1 John 2.15. 
do not love the world or anything in the world. In the next verse, he explains what the fruit of the world spirit is. He says that it is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the boastful pride of life. And James 1.27 admonishes believers to keep themselves from being polluted by the world. Listen, as long as we live on this earth, we have to be in this world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. You know, Paul tells us here that our dedication to God requires separation from the world around us. And you understand the only way to experience revival is to come out from the old and into the new. It's awful easy on any given day to find more of the world in us than Jesus in us. I mean, there's always something out there that, that is challenging our faith. And unfortunately, we give in to those things way too often. Dedicating our lives to God means that He is the one who shapes and molds our lives, not the world around us. I mean, think about it. Are you more of who you are this morning because of the pressures of the world that you're living in? Or are you more of who you are today because of the God who's living in you? If you have to say yes, then let me challenge you to examine. Examine the level of your dedication to God because it may just be that that living sacrifice that you're talking about, that you're called to be, that living sacrifice may just have crawled off the altar. If it was ever really on the altar in the first place. Because you see, Jesus in you, it ought to be changing you. I know for most, it isn't cool to be holy these days. In fact, it's often viewed as intolerant to be different. And it's considered unreasonable to allow your life to be governed and guided by the absolutes of God's Word. Or to be made holy by His Word. So it's easy just to deny the work that Jesus has done to make us holy. It's easy to say, man, I'm just a sinner like everybody else. Truth is, most Christians just want to quietly sink into the, the shadows of society and just kind of go along to get along. I mean, think about how many times you may have said of yourself, you know, as you're talking about your faith with somebody, man, I'm just a sinner like you, or I'm just an ordinary person, you know, just like you. Not I used to be, not I used to be a sinner, or I used to be an ordinary person, but I am. Do you ever stop and think about what you're saying? Listen, I realize that things like that, you know, we say things like that because we want to kind of remove the barriers that might be between us and a lost and dying world. I realize that none of us are perfect. None of us are without sin. And I'm thinking most of us, maybe all of us, do some really dumb stuff sometimes. But where's the hook? Where's the difference? Where's the draw? Where's the difference that we're supposed to be, you know, making that's supposed to be on display? Paul writes in Romans 6, 20, for when you were, that means past tense, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, there was no restraint. You did whatever you wanted to do. And he's, he says in verse 21, Paul asks, when you did that, when you had no restraint, when you did whatever you wanted to do, what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? He says, for the end of those things is death. Those things separated you from God and only produced death in you. He goes on to say in verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. In other words, now that you've been born again, now that you've been set free, now that you are a child of the King, he says the fruit that you get leads to sanctification. That means to be set apart. That means to be made holy, to be separated from the rest of the world. That means to stand out. That's what we're called to be and do as Christians. And he says, its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whether you understand it or fully embrace it, there is something inside all of us that longs to be a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. We were created with that longing. God wants us to pray big prayers. He wants us to dream big dreams and live in a power that comes so far beyond ourselves. God wants us to stand out in the crowd. God saved you. He saved me to become extraordinary and different than we were. This is why the gospel is so appealing, folks. At least it's why it should be. It's why it was so appealing to me. I never, I never wanted to be just a better version of who I was. I wanted to be a brand new me. And in dying with Christ, that's exactly what we get. We step into a life of resurrection, of supernatural influence, of all the meaning and purpose we ever longed for. As believers, we now live in a realm that was once so far beyond us. And truth is, most of the world is afraid to embrace that possibility. And they'll even try to suppress it. To most Christians, it seems too risky. Pastor, I might stand out. Pastor, I might be noticed. I might look like a fool. Folks, that's the point. God wants you to stand out. He wants you to be different. He wants you to be noticed. He wants you to reflect Christ into a dark and dying world. In fact, I believe that God wants us to run into the adventure of something so big and so glorious, so rooted in a greater reality that it actually sets us apart from the rest of the world. God doesn't want us to conform to the pattern of this world anymore. He wants to revive us to dream big dreams and see visions. He wants to, to revive us to pray fearlessly and open our eyes to His big picture. God wants us to step out of the shadows of darkness and into a world of ultimate meaning, into a world of ultimate power and love. He doesn't want us to be ignorant, I promise you. He wants you to acknowledge your limitations, but then He wants you to go ahead and be willing to live beyond them in Christ. Remember we read last week, Jesus said in Matthew 5 that we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In other words, we're supposed to be different. When I got saved, I was challenged to be different. And not just different than I was before. I was challenged to be different than everyone else. I was told that God had a plan for my life and that if I would bring my life alongside that plan, that I could discover the uniqueness of who I am in Christ. But folks, I can never discover that uniqueness of who I am in Christ if I just allow myself to blend into the darkness of this world like everybody else. The only thing that type of thinking does, and I want you to hear this, it destroys my distinctiveness. This is why so many people need revival. Your distinctiveness has been destroyed. Your distinctiveness has died. When we become Christians, the Bible teaches us that we're called out of an old life and into a new one. But there is an evil force in the heavenly realms that work against you that, that's always trying to stop you from accomplishing the holy purpose that God's called you to. And folks, this enemy is relentless. He doesn't get tired. He never gives up. He'll do everything he can to stop you from becoming more like Christ. We need that holy separation. The holy separation from the rest of the world to become more like Christ. And then finally, for us to cooperate with God in His work of making us more like Jesus, and for us to truly experience revival and revitalize our faith, the third key is transformation. Paul tells us here, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If our lives are to be living sacrifices to God fully and irrevocably, dedicated to Him as the desire of our heart 
And if at the same time we are to resist the world's efforts to you know, kind of press us into this ungodly, unchristlike mold and truly, truly revitalize our faith, then what has to happen is we've got to change the way we think about things. Because you see, if God can change your mind, He can change your life. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, he calls this process the mind set on the spirit as opposed to the mind set on the flesh. How difficult is it for something or someone to get your minds off of God and your dedication to Him? Doesn't take much, does it? I mean, we can forget God quicker than we can forget Sunday's sermon. Psalm 106, 21 says of Israel, they forgot God. They forgot God, their Savior. Remember, Moses warned them, when you've eaten and been satisfied, don't forget God. When everything seems to be going your way, don't forget God. Don't just remember Him when you're in over your head. Remember God at all times. Israel forgot God their Savior who'd done great things in Egypt. Our minds have got to be on a, in this constant state and lifelong renewal. When our minds are distracted from God and our devotion to Him, things are going to die quickly in us. That's why we've got to immediately return mentally to our decision to give our lives to Him as a living sacrifice. The Holy Spirit will convict us and lead us. We've got to pay attention and do it. And when you pay attention and you do it, the result is the step-by-step, experience-by-experiencing process of, of renewing our minds. That process will transform our lives toward a confident acceptance that the will of God is good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. The more our lives are transformed by right thinking, the more we'll prefer the will of God over anything else that the world has to offer, and the more the desire of our heart will be to become like Christ. If we really want to experience revival, we need these three keys. We need to be dedicated to God. We need to be separated from the world. And we need a transformed mind. And believe me, there's no better place, there's no better time to get started than right now. Would you stand with me as we close? God, I pray this morning that you would help us. Help us, Lord, right now to be dedicated to you. Help us right now, God, to focus on where we're at in this world. If we've gotten off of our meds, God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that we would get back on them, that we would find ourselves, Lord, following your prescription for revival, that we would make it such a priority in our lives that we would be sanctified, separated from the rest of this world. And then help us to transform our mind Help us to have such a strong understanding of who you are that we got something to brag about. God, I pray there not be one of your children leave here today serving you any longer out of obligation. But there will be a transformation not just of our minds but of our hearts right now toward serving you, relating to you. God would be the desires of our hearts going to ask you this morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed our counselors are going to come and man this might just be a time when you say God I've been off my meds way too long and I need to be made right with you maybe come and confess to God that you know you need to follow his prescription you know that right now that you, you don't have the kind of dedication that truly allows you to serve him out of desire rather than obligation. Confess that to him. He's not going to be mad at you. 
Remember I read to you Romans chapter 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God wants a love relationship with you. So you can come and, and tell God, God, I've just been serving you out of obligation. I want to serve you out of the depths of the desire of my heart. And then maybe you need to confess, I've got too much of the world in me, and that's what's been hindering me. Ask him if he'll help you transform your mind. As God gives you this opportunity during this time of invitation, would you come? Father God, we thank you for this time. God, would you help us to be guarding of our hearts and our minds. Help us not to rent out any space in our heads for the nonsense of this world that it has to offer. But instead, God, that we'd be guardful, that we would be willing to be a living sacrifice, suitable, pleasing to you. God, that we would truly allow our minds to be renewed so that we would be able to test and approve your will, your good and your pleasing and your perfect will. God, as we press forward from this place here today, I pray you would challenge our hearts to adhere to what we've heard. God, that we would allow it to be embroidered into our hearts and as a result, be lived in our lives. Let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>